welcome to Lecture 7 of our 24-part series of Baptist history. This is called Pseudo-Anabaptists and Anabaptist Hatred. As we just finished in Lecture 6, we covered what the Orthodox, true uh, Swiss brethren taught and believed, the eight distinctives. But in this lecture, what I want to do is separate the Orthodox Anabaptists from every other group that was called Anabaptist. Anabaptist, like I said, was a pejorative term. It was a term of derision, meant to uh, mock those, because they were saying, well, you're a rebaptizer. Their answer always was, no, we're doing it right the first time. Baptism, in biblical order, always follows salvation. Anabaptist uh, belies that. You're just saying something that we would absolutely disagree with. But there were other groups that were called Anabaptist by the magisterial reformers, by the Lutherans, by the French Swiss, by the Anglicans, that were not Anabaptists. They were called this term, and church history for 400 years now has taught these people were Anabaptists, but I'm here to tell you, and church history bears it out, they were not true Anabaptists. Some of them were anti-Trinitarian, and that's why they were called Anabaptists, rationalists, so to speak. Some of them were anti-infant baptism, but not Anabaptists. They didn't affirm Anabaptist doctrines, the eight distinctives. Anti-Trinitarians obviously didn't. Some of them were anti-Catholic, but they weren't Anabaptists. And others were simply anti-tradition. And anybody who was anti-tradition or anti-infant baptism or anti-Catholic or even anti-magisterial um, uh, reform, uh, anti-Trinity, they were called Anabaptists, but they were not. And we are in this lesson going to study them to show that they were not true Anabaptists, and thus the kinship is not the same. Notice in the introduction of part one. During the Reformation and post-Reformation periods, it saw the rise of these variant groups that, while sharing their antipathy towards uh, Catholicism in the state church, they were not, they were not allied with the Anabaptists at any time. The thing is, they got most of the press. Somewhat akin to David Koresh calling himself a Christian, all of us would violently say, no, no, no. But he called himself that, and thus the rest of the world saw him as one of the Christian nuts. I had a person at, uh, we used to have a thing called Hallelujah every year. It was like a big Christian parade. Down the center of town would come floats, and uh, they set up a big marquee, and they had uh, like a flea market of different Christian groups, different churches would sell funnel cakes and such, and they'd raise money and have gospel singing and etc. My church, my first year I got to the church in Manchester, Kentucky, we had a a per, you know, float in the parade. After I did the float, I go to the flea market. And there at the flea market, everybody in town would come. I mean, it was the day that everybody called themselves a Christian, so to speak. Thousands of people gathered together there in Clay County, Kentucky. And, and this guy, who was obviously three sheets to the wind, obviously drunk as a skunk, was singing along with the gospel music. Badly, might I add. And I come up to the guy and I go, you're liking the singing, ain't you? And he said, yep. You know, and he was barely able to stand leaning against a pole, and I start talking to him, and finally he says, I go, so uh, what church are you a member of? Hoping that if he said one of my buddy's churches, I was going to so dog them over that. Yeah, I met one of your members, you know. He's a member of my church. Hadn't been to church in 10 years, named a pastor that had left like eight years before. He said, yeah, pastor so-and-so. I was like, he's been gone for eight years. He may be on, the, on a roll somewhere, but he wasn't a member of the church. The same thing with these pseudo-Anabaptists. They may have had some connection, but they weren't true. But they, like this guy, were singing the loudest, got most of the attention. Notice I've divided them into three groups. There were radicals and revolutionaries who had an antipathy toward, a hatred of Catholicism, but they weren't Anabaptists. There were rationalists and anti-Trinitarians, the philosophers, and then there were spiritualists and mystics but they themselves weren't necessarily Anabaptists. We're going to look at these groups, show how they were called Anabaptists, but they were not true Anabaptists. Number one, the radicals and revolutionaries. The first one we're going to look at is a man by the name of Thomas Munzer. M-U-N-T-Z-E-R. Thomas Munzer. If he's anything, he is known as a Killiest. Killiest. Notice under point one sub A. He is attempting to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. That's right. He believed it was his job to bring about the kingdom of God. He was an educated man, had gone to Hall, and Munzer knew and corresponded with Martin Luther. In fact, he was a Lutheran radical if he was anything. 
because he identified himself with Lutheran principles and Lutheran teachings. Uh, 1513, he becomes a Catholic priest. He's appointed to the Zwickau Church, and this is important. You're going to hear the term Zwickau. Zwickau becomes this epicenter for apocalyptic fervor. I've got students that arrive to school 17 years old and want to study, you know, having been saved just a year or two, they want to study prophecy. And they're looking for Nikolai Carpathia in the book of Revelation somewhere. I knew his name's in there. I tried to word search it. Honey, that's made up. That was just a name. No, I know it's in there. You know what I mean? A little bit of knowledge can be dangerous. He had a little bit of knowledge. He, 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 and when he comes to Zwickau, that knowledge is ex exponentially enlarged by a lot of mysticism, a lot of apocalyptic fervor. Uh, he meets Nicholas Storch there. And while there, he also meets Luther, who was impressed with uh, Munzer's hope for and desire for Reformation. Uh, however, the guy when he would preach was inflammatory. Name names. Uh, he would often stand against things that nobody ever stood against, you know, just to do it, just to be, sort of be anti-something. 1521, 1523, while he's wandering through the Czech Republic, he writes a book called the, Pro the Prague Manifesto, where he maintains that he's actually a member of the Church of the Spirit of the Fear of God. Uh, inflammatory or not, he still is a very popular speaker, and he becomes very popular in Allstadt. Contemporary biographer Kessler wrote that 2,000 people in a town of 200 people, 2,000 people come in here and preach. Um, and here's what he called for. Preaching in the vernacular, in the language of the people, well, that's good. That's a good thing. Giving of both the elements of the Lord's Supper um, to the laity, and that's good. Don't just give them the bread, give them the wine as well. But remember, the guy's Achilleist. He's anti-baptism. Notice point D, he never baptizes adults. Forget being anti-infant baptism, he, he's anti-baptism. He's opposed to pedo-baptism, infant baptism, in theory only. Um, now, he preaches his famous sermon called The Sermon Before the Princes. He calls Luther the brother fatted swine. Yeah, he's breaking with Luther now. Brother soft life and Mr. Liar. He calls Lutheran theologians vicious reprobates. Munzer calls upon the common people to crush the godless leaders of the Lutheran Reformation. And by the way, I'll lead you, he says. Uh, the godless have no right to live except as the elect wish to grant it to them. Yikes. Ultimately, he's forced to flee again. Well, one would assume and hope so. <laughs> Fall 1524, between then and in the winter of 1525, he becomes a preacher in Mulhausen. And he becomes this popular preacher of the peasants. We're going to stop right here. If you ever study Luther, and you ever study the life of Martin Luther, Martin Luther was a preacher of the people, common man preacher. They loved him. Luther rarely had a doctrine of the church, per se, like Calvin. Calvin develops an unbelievably systematic doctrine of the church. For Luther, he's a preacher of the individual. You know, he wants to give the Bible back to the individual, Bible back to the person. He's known as a preacher of the, of the poor man until he stands against the peasants' revolt of 1525. When Luther stands up and preaches, I, I, I forget the name of the book right offhand, but it was like against the murderous thieving horde or something like that of the peasants. Well, who's the leader of the peasants' revolt? Thomas Munzer. Munzer is the Will Rogers of his people in that he, he finds out that he's going to be best followed if he becomes known as a preacher of the people. He calls for the overthrow of every city government, Protestant or Catholic. Overthrow them, and not just overthrow them, not just dethrone them, kill them. That the impoverished and the oppressed should kill the oppressor. Munzer and the Zwickau prophets, you'll hear more about them in a minute, the Zwickau prophets overthrow the city council and then they attempt, interestingly enough, to set up their own theocracy. Why? Because they believe they are setting up the kingdom of God on earth. He is captured, imprisoned, tortured, recants. Uh, his call after the peasants' revolt is squashed. In May of 1525, he is beheaded. Interestingly enough, found hiding under a bed when he is captured. His theology... Baptism. He questions even adult baptism since Mary or the disciples were neither baptized. So he is not a spiritualist, uh, Swiss brethren, or an Anabaptist. He was anti-baptism, not just anti-infant baptism. And as a firm believer in the use of, use of force and a practitioner thereof, he is not an Anabaptist pacifist. 
Zwickau prophets were his buddies. The Zwickau, the Zwickau prophets become the gadfly on Luther's behind. The entire time. Do you remember when Luther stands up at the Diet of Worms and says, here I stand, I can do no other, and then he has to flee? And, you know, he's, he's, he's protected by, by Hess and he's, he's uh, held by, the, by the, the princes who say, we'll hide you. You know why he comes back to Wittenborg? He comes back because while his church is pastorless, the Zwickau prophets come to power. They come into the church and, and well, let me tell you what they do. The Zwickau prophets are great friends of Munzer. Ni Nicholas Storch or Stork, uh, German preacher of rebellion, they believe they're constantly revealing new revelations of God, new dispensations of God that are equal to Scripture. Wait a minute, I got a new revelation, they would say. And it's not just supplemental to Scripture, it's not equated to Scripture, it's better than Scripture because it's new. During Luther's year in exile, they come to the city. It forces Luther to return because Karlstad, by the way, Karlstad, when Luther leaves, Karlstad's left in charge of the church, he's the associate pastor who becomes the pastor. Man, Karlstad starts throwing everything out. He gets rid of ordinances, gets rid of robes, gets rid of, you know, he just throws everything out. And so Luther's going, is everything falling apart here? So he has to come back. And then when the Zwickau prophets are standing up to preach and they say, wait a minute, according to the book of me, chapter 4, you know, Luther has to return against, you know, against his better wishes because he could stay hiding and, and be safe. As violent revolutionaries. They fought with the peasants in the, pre the Peasants' War 1525 when Luther opposes them vehemently. Zwickau prophets told the pilgrims to pillage and to destroy their theology. No ministers. Everybody's equal. You can put an ellipsis after this. Put a dot, dot, dot and say, except the prophets. Because they're the ones getting the revelation. They're the ones getting a word. Community of goods. Communal communism. Everybody give to the pot. And this isn't the Anabaptist spiritual communion. In the Anabaptist world, and you can still see it among the Amish, if somebody's house burns down, everybody shows up the next day to help build them a new barn, build them a new house. That's communal living. Their communal living got rid of marriage because everybody's married to everybody. A fine line between helping each other out and a spiritual rationalization for an orgy. Rejection of all external ordinances. Believe they were setting up the kingdom of God. Are they Anabaptists? No. But when somebody mocks and says, oh, you're one of the Zwickau prophets, I've only got one wife. Next, Melanchthon Rink. Denounced infant baptism vehemently as an external act. However, he takes, place, he takes part of the, uh, the Battle of Frankenhausen. He participates in every battle known as the Greek. He would use the Greek when he preached. Let's look at Hoffman. Is Hoffman... Because Menno Simons used Hoffmanite Christology. Is Hoffman an Anabaptist? My answer, no. He's a well-known revolutionary, Achilles, falsely named an Anabaptist. His prophecies called thousand, caused thousands of Dutch Anabaptists to go to Munster in the 1530s. Why? I'll explain Munster in a minute. And he believed that the second coming was going to return. He named a date. Naming of dates didn't just pop out of the ground with uh, William Miller in 1844, 1843, 1844. It didn't pop out of the ground with the guy who wrote... 88 reasons why Christ is returning in 1988. You know. A lot of people want to name dates. And when it doesn't come, what happens? You got a lot of disillusioned people who've sold everything and they're sitting on top of their house wanting to know what happens next. In 1523, 10 years before, he is a Lutheran missionary who's sent to Germany and Sweden. 1529, he meets Karlstadt in Denmark. He travels to Strasbourg where he's rebaptized. Now, at this point, it sounds like he's affiliating right. Hold on. He's, Karlstadt's a Lutheran, right? Are Lutherans rebaptizing? Answer, no. You're having some blurring of lines here. And the further you'd get away from Wittenborg, you'd have groups that were sort of duly aligned between different groups. But he goes to Strasbourg, is not rebaptized by Karlstadt, but he's moving in that direction, and Karlstadt helps him come to grip with this. Continue. 1533, Karlstadt, after calling his disciples to go to Munster, volunteers to go to jail. Why? Well, Christ's going to return anyways. I can go to heaven from a jail cell. It's safe. Three squares and a, and a, and a cot. Here's his theology. <laughs> Christ doesn't return. He's in prison for 10 years. And he dies in prison. 
Man, don't you think that's a depressing 10 years? Lord, I thought, was I off? It must be next year. Let's look at his theology. He wanted to be identified with the Anabaptists. Call me an Anabaptist. But taking a name without taking the theology is as silly as holding the theology but not wanting to take the name. I'm not mocking churches that take Baptists off their name as long as you tell them what your theology is. I'm just mocking those that want to hide it because they don't want anybody to know. We don't like to use those terms here. Great. You're telling them your geography, but you're not telling them your theology. You're tricking people into coming to church? Come on. What he did was he kept wanting to use the name, but he didn't want to affirm the distinctives of what made the Anabaptists the Anabaptists. He believed Christ was setting up the New Jerusalem, by the way, in Strasbourg. That's interesting. And to add to it, he believes that he's one of the two witnesses who have never died in Revelation chapter 11. Hoffmanite Christology, as I've talked about, that Jesus flowed through Mary like water through a pipe. Mary is only a conduit. That Jesus got his flesh from the Father. That he got all of his DNA. Not, you know, mixing the chromosomes of uh, the the woman and and God, the Holy Spirit, but, but that it's all chromosomally on a genetic level from God. Well, let's look at how all these people worked in Munster. Because Munster is, in fact, the worst debacle that happens among the Anabaptists. Because when Munster takes place, everybody who's not an Anabaptist, who's been hunting the Anabaptist, points to it and goes, See? Again, just like Waco. How many times did somebody go, Oh, well, that's all Christianity. Or when some popular television preacher falls, they all go, "Mm Mm-hmm. Are you one of them? Whether or not you have the same theology. Whether or not you're even affiliated with the person. Watch. There's a guy by the name of Jan Matthias. has a great visceral hatred for anybody who's rich. Matthias is one of those guys who resents anybody who's got any kind of position. He's a Catholic priest, von Waldeck, uh, was immoral beyond words. I can't even describe it here because there's a, a camera running. But this guy, if there was a way to get into it, he got into it. And he would use... Yeah, Matthias would use this priest as an illustration of all Catholics. He would say, all of them are like this guy. What we're about to describe was described all the way through Europe as this is what the Anabaptists are. Here's how it works. 1531, Reformation comes to the city. 1534, Matthias takes over the city, calling himself an Anabaptist. He sets up a political government controlled by the church. Underline that, please, and then look this way. He sets up a government, an Anabaptist government. That sort of defy logic? The guys whose central tenet is the separation of church and state? And yet he sets up an Anabaptist government. He announces his plans to kill everybody who's godless. It includes Catholics and Lutherans. Well, who do you think surrounds the city? Catholics and Lutherans. And literally, they surround the city walls. Matthias is killed in the fight. The first battle. As Munster is under siege, Matthias dies. Well, there's still somebody to take his shoes. John of Leyden comes in. He takes control of the city. What does he do? Well, he doesn't rule by himself. He appoints, remember, this is apocalyptic fervor. There will be 12 elders. It's New Jerusalem, right? crowned himself, and I quote, the king of righteousness of all. Is this Anabaptist? No, but it gets worse if you think this is bad. The, he, he sets up the kingdom of Munster. For 16 months, they are surrounded by Catholics and Lutherans. They're under siege, constantly having to fight. Church and the state is made one under a king. So you see what he's done. He's separated prophet, priest, and king and made them all king. Communism is introduced because the city's under siege. Polygamy is introduced because all the men are getting killed and we have to continue our children. The fall of Munster, April the 7th, 1535. Just 10 years after the first Anabaptism, this becomes the poster child for all of Anabaptists. The aged and the ill are kicked out of the city. He actually does like Eskimos, setting the ill, you know, sets the ill, they set the ill and the elderly out on a water flow, on an iceberg, and give them three days worth of water because they can't contribute to the society anymore, right? 
Well, they send the old people out for their certain death. They send the crippled out because, you know what, we can't sustain you. The city was under siege for an entire year by Catholic forces. In the end, I kid you not, they eat each other because they'd run out of food and run out of meat. Cannibalism. The city is captured. All the males are killed instantly. Laden is captured, caged, and carted around in his example. He is tortured with red-hot tongs and then starved to death slowly. The corpses of the Munsterites are placed in St. Lambert's cage where they literally remain for centuries. St. Lambert's cage was used sort of like putting a head on a stick as you walk into a city to show, try this again and here's what will happen to you. Well, the effects on the Anabaptists. Obviously, they weren't Anabaptists. But what are the effects? Like all Killius movements, they hurt our reputation. In this instance, with horror and bloodshed, it was worse. Everybody heard of Munster. Everybody knew what was taking place. Everybody had heard, oh, they were eating flesh, human flesh. Is that what you guys do? They were not Anabaptists. They were anti-Roman, anti pado baptist but they forced conversion. They took the sword. They held no hermeneutic. They were, they were revolutionary Killiists. All right, let's look at rationalists and anti-Trinitarians. Certain groups empathized with the Anabaptists because they stood against any mythical teachings of transubstantiation. They stood against baptism because they were against Christianity in general. Michael Servetus, great picture, the guy who's killed by Calvin. Michael Servetus wasn't a Christian. Michael Servetus was the Voltaire of his day. You know, he was just a rationalist, a philosophically minded guy, a philosopher. He was anti-Trinitarian, anti-baptism, anti-anything. But because he was against infant baptism, thus he was called an Anabaptist. Servetus, the, he believed that the doctrine of the Trinity stood in the way of reaching Jews and Muslims. Because Muslims, obviously the Quran teaches, uh, say not that God is a trinity. They do blaspheme those who teach this, according to the Quran it says. So he said, we've got to find a way to reach Jews who say, Shema Yisrael, Deuteronomy 6, uh, know that the Lord thy God is one God. Well, since the Jews believe only in one God, don't, don't agree with the trinity, Muslims, you know, they hold to Tawhid in the Arabic, which means absolute oneness of God. What do we do? Let's get rid of the trinity. We'll be able to reach them with Christ. He's a philosopher, sort of a front edge kind of new programmatic guy, denying the Trinity, of course. He proves he wasn't a Christian. Remember this. Define the Trinity, and you're going to lose your mind. Deny the Trinity, and you lose your soul. You don't have to believe in the Trinity to be saved. An eight-year-old child doesn't understand one substance, three persons. But you can't deny the Trinity and have been saved. Well, let's look at what he says. He argues against Calvin, leads to his death. His stance against the Catholic Church and the French-Swiss movement ties him to the Anabaptist in, his, in, in the public's eyes. Socians, who are against the Trinity, but they're also against the Holy Spirit. S-O-C-I-A-N-S. -S, Socians. L uh, the leader was a lawyer from Poland, known as a very upright guy, accepted the Helvetic Confessions, but he rejects the divinity of Christ, believes that the Holy Spirit's basically a wind, or the electricity of God, so to speak. Um, he rejects the Trinity. This is sort of a Unitarian. Socians are often called Universalists or Unitarians. They were hunted like the Anabaptists too. Many are burned at the stake just like the Anabaptists. And so everybody's saying, see, they're Anabaptists. No, they weren't. Let's look at the spiritual. And by the way, notice the Socius is killed by whom? Bullinger. The guy who takes over Zwingli's group. All right. There were those that were tied to the Anabaptists who weren't necessarily revolutionaries. And they weren't necessarily anti-Trinitarian and thus a uh, heresy or, or cultic group. There were those, and i got to say this gently. You know what a mystic is? Inner light, spirit-driven. I'm not talking about Holy Spirit loving because we're all Holy Spirit loving. I'm talking about they are more, they're the type of person that says, mm, a lot. Mmm, yes, yes. Mmm. -hmm. Sort of a sensory type of Christian. Nothing against them. I am a logic-driven person. I am a rational believer. I, I believe that Christianity is logically imperative. It's proven by God who created logic, obviously reveals himself logically. And I believe in these things. But man, some of them you'll go, well, do you believe in the Trinity? Yes. Well, how would you prove it to somebody? How do you explain it to somebody? They go, mmm. 
well, you really can't, but I can feel it. I mean, really, we are in a mystical time now, aren't we? We are in a period of mystical Christianity. We are in a, what I call, touchy-feely, scratch-and-sniff Christianity. Everything we talk about. We don't talk about, I believe. What do we talk about now? I feel. That makes me feel. You have them in your church. I've got them in my church. They'll send you forwards by email. You know what I'm talking about? It's the forward that begins, read this poem. Delete, 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 delete. Hanky alert. Uh, scroll down. If you love Jesus, send this to everybody in your dress book. If you love Jesus, tithe. Stop playing with forwards. Anybody delete them immediately? Or am I the only one? Okay, I'm glad to hear it. That, you know, nothing against them, guys. Please hear me. Nothing against them, because some people love poetry. You know, Helen Steiner Rice, Apples of Gold, they love that stuff. I'm not. I'm just, that's just not the way I'm built. None against them. Spiritualists who are Anabaptists, that's one group. But these guys that we're about to discuss were mystics. Genuinely believed there was the Old Testament, there was the New Testament, and there's the Now Testament. What's God doing now? And they cross the line between holding in an absolute orthodoxy to a orthodoxy that's still developing. If you would ask them, are there 66 books of the Bible, they'd say, yeah, for now, because there's more coming. Mystics got into this, we're crossing a line into a beyond touchy-feely, we're now getting cultic. Watch. They taught that each Christian had an individualistic, mystical experience, this inner light pietism. And again, please understand me. I'm going to look right in this camera. I am not saying everybody who holds to a, a personal encounter with God is a cult because they're not. I hold to a personal encounter with God. I believe that God reveals His will for my life to me. I do not believe, however, that this usurps Scripture or ever contradicts Scripture or even comes close to equating to Scripture. I believe it is always in accordance with Scripture. So please don't get me wrong here. I'm talking about those that took something that's good and made it an aberration. Watch. Contradicted any belief in a regulative pr principle, a regulative Bible, a communal accountability, absolute truth. Absolute truth always makes them nervous. Because if you say, this is absolute, they'll say, hmm. Hmm. Watch. Let's look at Sebastian Frank. What's Sebastian Frank? You can write next to his name somewhere, a neo-anabaptist. Like a neo-evangelical, neo-orthodox, you know. They, they may like some of the same things we like, but they say there's new stuff coming. Watch. He's a, Re he's a Reformation minister in, in Gustenfelden. His, his standpoint was strictly Lutheran. He, he also attacked the Anabaptists. However, he writes a book where his radicalism began, begins to... He talked about 10 or 11 nations... Nobody possesses full truth. Everybody's sort of coming to different parts of truth. At the end of the book, he intimates that besides the three strongest faiths, Luther, Zwingli, and the Anabaptists, a new one's coming. Now, where do we hear this? We hear this all the time. Latter rain. The latter rain. Dominion. You know, anybody who says that the latter rain, God's going to get rid of all denominations. We're all going to be one. And apparently you're going to be our leader? Well, yeah. I love it when there's a meeting of non-denominational churches. If you have a meeting of non-denominational churches, your denomination, well, we're just a gathering. Call it what you want. That's a denomination. The point is, is that anybody who thinks we're coming up with something new, there's nothing new under the sun. Solomon knew that. Heresy remains the same. Truth always remains the same because truth's unkillable. You may find new ways to express it, but you're not inventing anything. Watch. This fourth faith would be, quote, an invisible spiritual church would be governed by the invisible word of God without external means of ceremony, sacraments, sermons. Do you get what I'm saying? Remove everything. Start fresh. As a result, he has to resign his church, moves to Strasbourg, and becomes this sort of mystical writer. Um, he held that the whole external church all of its institutions were corrupted by the Antichrist after the time of the apostles. The inner illumination of the Spirit's all we need. We don't need a Bible. All we need is a, is a touch. We must all unlearn 
what we have learned from the Pope, dot, 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 and Luther. See what he's doing? Boy, it's tough to teach that something new is coming when the newest thing is only about 10 years old. But that's what he's doing. Continue. Caspar von Schwenkenfeld. Schwenkenfeld is an inner light guy, true pietist. I mean, in the classic sense, and I'll show you, Schwenkenfelders are still out there. Man, these guys are inner light. Watch. 1519, he experiences what he called a visitation from God. I don't know if he was 90 feet tall. Uh, don't know if he visited a crusade meeting. I don't know what it was. But he says, I've got this inner move. And he talks about it in terms that it's almost incarnational. I saw him. Watch. He's deeply affected by the writings of Luther. He seriously studies scripture. The more he studies, the more he discovers areas where Luther's theology and his theology disagree. He believes the true Christian at the Lord's Supper table ate the spiritual body of Christ would and that what you're eating would grow like a seed that had been planted in ground, transform you into the image of God and the person, personal uh, of Christ. In other words, dogs have puppies. Cats have kittens. God, who is implanted in you during the Lord's Supper, turns you into a little God. That which is implanted transforms you. 1541, he publishes the Great Confession on the Glory of God. His Christology is that Christ's human flesh was increasingly divinized while he was on the earth, so that he was eventually transfigured, resurrected, and taken up in glory. It was Christ's invisible and glorified flesh that Casper thought the believers ate during the Lord's Supper. They were called confessors. Do you, get, now do you follow the pattern here, Schwinkelfeld's teaching? Christ was the first one at the Lord's Supper who is slowly transforming, metamorphosizing in front of our very eyes from the human turning into God. And we, after we are saved, take the Lord's Supper. The more you take it, the more that's planted inside you and slowly you are transformed, metamorphosized like an alien coming out of you. Except instead of being, you know, ugly and horrific, it's divine. Five congregations of Schwenkefelters persisted in Pennsylvania at the start of this century. In virtually every doctrinal stance, he disagreed with the Anabaptists. Now let's close this section by really paying attention to something here. Do they really hate the Anabaptists? Oh, but they do. And I'm going to give you quotes from their own writings. Due to the aforementioned pseudo-Anabaptist, as well as Swiss Brethren teachings against infant baptism, any Christian commonwealth, historians of all kinds, including guys who call themselves Baptists, Baptist theologies in the last four decades have been wrong. They have been biased against the Anabaptists. What they do is they neglect the fact. They, they treated the Anabaptists with all this bias, saying that, oh, well, the Munstrites, that's the Anabaptists. No, I've just proven to you that they weren't. So what they do is they lump Anabaptists together with these guys, and they neglect the fact that men that we like for many of their doctrines, such as John Calvin, Martin Luther... Um, Heinrich Bullinger, the Westminster Confessors, Sorting Confession, Belgic Confessions. All these things are great doctrinal confessions as far as theology is concerned, and every one of them has something in common. They all had some little clause in there against the Anabaptists, which they saw as a threat. Why? Let me show you their own words. John Calvin, quote, in his preface to the Commentary on the Psalms, 1557, We have treated no one with cruelty except the Anabaptists. And the seditious persons who by their perverse ravings and their false opinions were overthrowing not only religion, but civil order. So he saw it as an overthrow of religion, but also an overthrow of the society that they were trying to establish. Calvin indeed, and by his own marriage, he proved this. He marries Idoletta, who is the widow of John Storador, a former Anabaptist pastor. Storador himself had confessed his, quote, crime of Anabaptism to, uh, to Calvin and had gone over to become a reformer. He has this guy rebaptized. He rebaptized a rebaptizer because he believed that the Anabaptists were not true Christians. In his, in his writings against the heirs of the common sect of the Anabaptists, which I have, which you should get, of the Anabaptists, he declared that on several principal points of Christianity, they agree closely, closely with the Papists, with Roman Catholics, holding a view directly repugnant to all the Holy Scriptures, as with free will, predestination, and the cause of our salvation. And again, the idea of general atonement here, he saw if you held a general atonement, um, it was almost as if saying you weren't saved. It is therefore with deception that they abuse this pretext, making simple believe that they wish to be governed totally according to the Scripture, for they don't hold to it whatsoever, 
but only to the fantasy of their brain. Well, what was his teaching about infant baptism? Here's his words, and I'm only going to read the first one. We baptize infants, God, under the Old Testament, in order to show himself to be the father of infants, was pleased that the promise of salvation should be engraven on their bodies by a visible sign. It were unbecoming to suppose that since the advent of Christ, believers now have less to confirm them. The force and the substance of baptism are common to children. To deny them the sign, which is inferior to the substance, were manifest and just. Children are to be baptized. They are heirs of the blessing promised in the seed of the believers. Catechism that he wrote, 1545. Um, we set down as incontrovertible that none of the elect is called away from the present life without previously being sanctified and regenerate in the Spirit of God. We deny the power of God cannot regenerate infants. Underline that, please. We deny that the power of God can't regenerate infants. If they're elect, theoretically, infants are regenerate before the foundation of the world. So he says God regenerates the infant. God can regenerate the infant. This is as possible and as easy for him to do as it is wonderfully and incomprehensible to us. It were dangerous to deny the Lord is able to furnish them with the knowledge of himself in any way he pleases. They can be saved even if they can't read, write, blink, whatever. Anglicans and reformers against the Anabaptists. Swiss Calvinist Bullinger had a massive influence on England against the Anabaptists. Uh, and I've given you a bunch of his writings, but let me just give you a couple of things in England. 1553, the Edwardian Articles. Edward, the king. The 42 articles are a double-edged weapon designed to smite two opposite enemies. On one hand, they attack the medieval teaching and abuses. They oppose even more keenly the teaching of the Anabaptists. The name Anabaptist was given to them from their denial of infant baptism and their custom of rebaptizing converts. There's hardly any error of doctrine or morality that was not proclaimed by some of them. They were a very real danger to all order in the church and state alike. John Knox. Already in 1557, Calvin's faithful student, a Scottish reformer, Knox, had written a book entitled The Warning Against the Anabaptists. There, Knox condemned those who, quote, have separated themselves from society and communion of their brethren into sects damnable and most pernicious. Those sectarian Anabaptists, conceded Knox, really do have a zeal, but it is not according to knowledge. This sort of men fall from the society of Christ's little flock with contempt of his sacraments. See the word sacraments there? And holy ordinances by us truly maintained. Indeed, they require a greater purity that has ever even found in any congregation since the beginning. Knox then immediately went on to insist that Anabaptists, quote, shall not escape judgment and condemnation. This is so, declared Knox, because they do despise Christ Jesus and his ordinances. 1560, he wrote an answer to the great number of blasphemous cavillations written by an Anabaptist and an adversary. And he calls them Pelagians. Uh, with the Pelagist and Papist, you have become teachers of free will and defenders of your own injustice, of your own justice. Your poison is more pestilent than any papistry. You're worse than the Roman Catholics, he said. In his first book of discipline, he said, Anabaptists, Arians, and others are enemies of the Christian religion. Belgic Confession. Many of us, maybe even in this room, and watching by television, uh, are Belgic confessors. Well, let's read this, 1582. Therefore we detest the error of the Anabaptists who are not content with only one baptism they have once received, the infants of believers we believe ought to be baptized, sealed with the sign of the covenant, as the children of Israel formerly were circumcised. What circumcision was to the Jews, that baptism is to our children. Second Swiss Confession. Anabaptists wish to abandon the Papists and the Evangelicals and are living in a new Baptist order. We condemn, the Belgic says, the Anabaptists, who, as they deny that a Christian man should bear office of a magistrate, deny also that any man can justly be put to death by the magistrate, or that the magistrate may make war. For he that opposes himself against the magistrate does provoke the wrath of God. We condemn, therefore, all contemptors of magistrates, rebels, enemies of the commonwealth, seditious villains, and, in a word, all who openly or closely refuse to perform such duties which they owe. Sign out of Dort. Beza's reworking of Calvin's teaching. Uh, Calvin always struggled with where to put predestination. In the various publications of the Institute. Sometimes he put it in book one, other times he put it in book three. Put it in book one, he put predestination before creation. Put it in book three, he made it a part of salvation. Before he dies in 1564, Calvin's final Institute puts it in book three. It's, it was Calvin's way to balance it, or Calvin's way to finally try to deal with the tension. Not Beza, baby. Beza is a scholastic Calvinist, and Beza says, 
put it in book one, make it the first sentence of book one. And the Synod of Dort begins with this sentence. Predestination is the head of all doctrine. It means everything filters through predestination. Well, because of this reworking, which I would, I would suggest is the actual hyper-Calvinism. Uh, Calvin's isn't, but this is. They were also equally against the Anabaptists. It says, The children of believers are holy not by nature, but by virtue of the covenant of grace in which they, together with their parents, are comprehended. Godly parents have no reason to doubt the election and salvation of those children whom it pleases God to call out of this life in their infancy. It's the point that I make about five-pointers. I have never met a five-pointer who didn't think he and his kids were in. Why? Because they have a covenant view. You have to adopt a covenant view. If you're going to teach that baptism, if you're going to hold to this view, the only way your children are truly elect, without question, is that your children are in covenant. Westminster Confession. Before baptism, this is, by the way, a fascinating explanation of how you're supposed to do it. Before baptism, the minister is to use some words of instruction showing that the seed and posterity of the faith born within the church have by their birth interest in the covenant and the right to the seal of it. They are Christians. I'm talking about the infant being baptized. They are Christians. And they are federally holy before baptism. And therefore, are they baptized? He is to baptize the child with water, which... For the manner of doing it is not only lawful but sufficient and most expedient to be by pouring or sprinkling of water on the face of the child without adding any other ceremony. That's how you're supposed to carry it out. Lecture 7, if anything, is a summary of the overview of why the Anabaptists were hunted. I'd hunt them too if I thought that they were like the Munsterites. And here I am, an Anabaptist kinsman. But if I thought that their job was to overthrow every city council and set up their own kingdom, well, they're a threat to every Catholic kingdom. They're a threat to every Protestant kingdom. They think that they're the revelation witnesses. Certainly, they're a threat to seditious order. They're a seditious threat to order. They're anarchists. And that's why lumping the Anabaptists together was necessary to stand against them. Secondly, you can understand that Calvin, Knox, Bullinger, Luther, all of these people had a genuine reason for wanting the Anabaptists to stop. If you like a Christian commonwealth and see a Christian commonwealth, magistrate, theocracy, and see a Christian commonwealth as a working out of the kingdom of God, anything that threatens that is certainly against the Christian order you're trying to establish. If that were the story and the end of it, that'd be enough. But here's the worst part. The deception of teaching that these groups, these seditious nut job groups, and that's the theological term for it. The fact that people still teach that these were true Anabaptists shows me that we have a paucity of true church history teaching, shows me that we have a lack of true understanding of church history, and that people will always study by an agenda. I'll look right in that camera and I'm going to tell you I have an agenda. I am a missions and evangelism, hanky-waving, soul-saving kind of Christian. I believe if you ain't sweating, you ain't preaching. I believe if you enjoy Jesus, say amen. I am a typical revivalistic, fundamental, down-the-line Christian. So I got an agenda. I believe if you ain't knocking on doors, you're lazy. I believe that every church ought to grow or it's dying. There's no such thing as a church that stagnates. I believe if you're growing deeper in Jesus, then you love souls more. Don't tell me you're deep by telling me how many certificates you got on your wall. Tell me you're deep. If you've truly grown deep, your eyes see the world through the eyes of Christ. And He came to seek and save that which is lost. I believe the mark and measure of Christian ministry and Christian maturity is how many lost friends you've got. How many people you're actually out in the world trying to love and teach and reach and tell. God will not hold us accountable for the number of people we win. I'm not a numbers guy. But He will hold us accountable to the number of people we tell the number of opportunities we use where He gives us that chance. So I have an agenda. I've just given it to you in summary. I am old-fashioned. I am old-school. It's why as you watch this DVD, you're never going to see pictures show up or my PowerPoint presentation. All I know how to do is lecture. Outside of this lectern, I'm an idiot. I can't drive a nail. I can't fix a car. I can't hang anything. I can't paint anything. I don't know what's under the engine of my car. I don't know what kind of car I drive. I don't know how much I make, and I can't pay bills. I paid bills my entire life by color. 
You know what I mean? If it came in a white envelope, I'm ignoring it. But if it was blue, said last chance, nah, I'm, I'm going to open it. I know, I know nothing outside of what I do. There's my agenda. And I think it shows us that if we were going to be really translucent, really authentic, and really honest, church history needs to be honest and admit. If we're going to be fair, don't call somebody a name unless they earned it. And to ignore the Anabaptists who were the Orthodox, the ones who held to the eight distinctives, and to lump others in with them, the Kiliasts and the nut jobs and the apocalyptic fervor boys, is an injustice, does a disservice, and quite frankly, it's poor scholarship. Next time.